Hello and welcome. Today I'd like to show you this Socket 370 mainboard. At the first glance, nothing exciting. It is built around a wire chipset and supports Pentium 3 copper mine CPU with up to 1133 MHz at 133 MHz frontside bus. This board has no AGP slot as you can see, but it has an integrated Trident Blade 3D VGA which is weak, but is not bad for DOS gaming though, and this is why this board caught my eye. It seems to have everything you would need for a cheap and small DOS and Windows 95 machine. The frontside bus and the CPU could be throttled down to get to a speed of a 486 machine and play games which wouldn't run at the full speed otherwise. The integrated DOS compatible Realtek network adapter the set Trident VGA has a good compatibility with DOS games and the board has an ISO slot on board which could be used for a dedicated sound card. And speaking of sound cards, this was the main reason why I got interested in trying out this mainboard. It has an onboard via VT1611A sound chip, for which DOS drivers are available on the internet and I wanted to check out how that works already many times. First of all, the onboard sound card has to be activated and there are a couple of ways how that can be done. On this mainboard the BIOS includes the related options in the menu, integrated peripherals. There you have to activate the onboard legacy audio and also sound blaster. You can set up the IRQ, DMA and other resources like MPU401 and game port as well. At this point, when you boot the system into DOS, the games would already detect the sound card properly and set up the sound blaster. However, when trying to play back anything, there will be just silence. What you need now is a driver, which you can find for example on Voguns. The original driver contains among others the executable via fmtsr.com, which initializes the hardware and turns on the OPL3 compatible FM sound. Once that driver is initialized, your sound card should work. I will come back to the via fmtsr.com in a minute, but let's talk first about the initialization. As I said, that driver is needed to initialize the sound card and enables the sound eventually. I might be wrong about it, but as far as I understood, that works only if your mainboard BIOS has the accordant settings to enable the hardware. But not all mainboards provide that options. For such cases, a Vogons user, Jace Fox, who is also known for the Unisound DOS drivers, implemented a similar VIA onboard sound enabler named ViaSBCFG.com. Similar to the Unisound driver, this one uses the blaster environment variable to set up and enable the VIA onboard sound card. It also has sound volume options and it doesn't need the hardware settings in BIOS. This driver should enable the digital sound, but for the FM sound you still will need the mentioned via fmtsr.com. And here we are, facing the first inconvenience which I discovered, the memory which the driver via fmtsr.com needs. It is a TSR driver, which has to remain in memory all the time, and it takes almost 40 kilobytes of memory, which is huge when talking about DOS conventional memory. Many games need more than 600 kilobytes of free conventional memory, and with via fmtsr.com loaded, that is barely possible. Luckily, when using Expanded Memory Manager, we can load this driver into the upper memory by using LH or load high command. I gave this a try and none of the games which I tested have shown any issues with the driver loaded into the upper memory. However, some DOS games can have issues with expanded memory manager loaded like EMM386 or QMM386, so using via FMTSR driver can up in a real memory problem. By the way, the via sbcfg.com by JaceFox just enables the hardware but doesn't stay in memory. Anyway, let's finally hear how it sounds. Seven. Seven.
as you probably noticed, we have only mono sound. One speaker is totally silent. I don't use a software mixer, so there must be something with hardware. In such a case, it is always worth it to start the investigation with the amplifier. It usually has two bigger decoupling caps, uh, one on the left channel and one on the right. In the background, I turned on the stereo FM playback in the setup program of uh, the game Descent. Let's see what is happening on the channels. As you see, on one channel there is some activity. On the other channel there are constant 12 volts. The amplifier I see is also quite warm to be honest. It is a very common issue on the sound cards. If you have some distortion or missing channels on the output, check the amplifier and the capacitors around it. If one of the bypass caps would have a short, we would measure zero volts somewhere and in some cases the PSU would even go into protection. The caps on which I measured the voltages were decoupling caps and even if they would be short, we wouldn't get constant 12 volts. So the next suspect is the amplifier. With some 300 degrees Celsius hot air, the IC can be quickly desoldered. The original amplifier was a TL072C. I couldn't find the same one, but I compared the datasheets and the very common LM358 has the same pinout and essential specs. Accidentally, I had a pack of new such amps, so this will be it. And here we go, the amplifier was probably defective indeed, and there is stereo sound coming out of the speakers now. I tested some games and most of them worked very well. Games like Doom, Lemmings and Prince of Persia worked out of the box. The OPL3 emulation was definitely not nearly like the original Yamaha, but it was not the worst I heard and surprisingly even the AD PCM sound in Duke Nukem 2 worked fine. However, in some games I ran into strange timing or performance issues. For example, in Commander Keen 4, the music was playing slower when I was moving and turned back to normal when I stopped for a while. The same issue was in Wolfenstein 3D, where the overall FM quality was quite bad anyway.
In Titus the Fox, the sound was also heavily dependent on the movement in the game and the moving objects were heavily flickering. But the worst result was in Duke Nukem 3D. There, not only music, but the overall sound was heavily stuttering and the game was barely playable. I spent some time experimenting with the BIOS settings and nothing helped, but I noticed that pressing the keys on the keyboard always influenced the sound in the affected games, so I tried to deactivate the USB keyboard support in the BIOS and plugged the same keyboard through an adapter into a PS2 port instead. And surprisingly, that fixed the issue for most games. Here is Commander King 4. As you see, no music slow downs at all now. And the same improvement in Wolfenstein 3D. Unfortunately, in Duke Nukem 3D I still had the same problems. The music was changing the speed and sound effects were stuttering. On the other hand, in Titus the Fox not only music slowdowns were fixed, but also objects flickering was no more. And of course, I made a comparison of the VIA OPL3 implementation to the original Yamaha OPL3. Therefore, I used this Creative Sound Blaster 16 ISO sound card with the dedicated Yamaha chip on it. Here is one of my most favorite game soundtracks, Descent 2.
previous Wolfenstein 3D, which I didn't find to be very good on wire, to be honest. <laughs> Also different, but didn't sound bad. was a little repair and trying out the DOS compatible via onboard sound. I had it on my list for longer and finally I found some time to get my hands on. Would I suggest this board for a retro machine? Well, partially yes. If you want to use it standalone, it is cheap and it has everything on board what you need. Network, sound, VGA, you can set up the CPU speed in software to slow down the CPU. The board has also an ISO slot for another sound card for example. Unfortunately, it has no AGP slot and the internal Trident Blade 3D is everything else but a fast GPU. You could use a Voodoo 2 in it, but to be honest, if you plan to use an expansion card anyway, maybe it's worth it to take another mainboard too. This one is a good choice for a really small retro PC without any additional cards at all, or maybe with one ISO card in an angled riser. One small thing left to tell. This short slot down here, some people are curious what this is for. Well, this is so-called communication and networking riser or short CNR slot and it was used for such optional modem expansion cards. Nothing interesting from today's point of view, but maybe interesting to see for completeness. And this is it for today. As you see, sometimes even such a plain board can give us an interesting use case for experiments. I hope you enjoyed this overview, thank you and goodbye.